Hello everybody and welcome to Blam UK's first event of the year. It is so nice to be in community with you all. We normally do these sort of events four times a year, but due to COVID we've actually not been able to do as many events as we have wished to have done. Um, but we said, we always say stuff, COVID can't stop we. So um, we've decided to take some of our event spaces online and we had about three events last year. And then we hope that this year we can at least do four events, but if not, do events as and when. So um, if you don't know me, my name is Effa Thompson. Um, I am usually your hostess with the mostess, but I'm joined today with Tolu, who is our programme lead, who will be supporting Wednesday's pro project and plan. Um, so a bit about me, I'm the founder of Blam UK and I work on our projects. Um, I think it's always important for us to tell you a bit more about Blam because we always have new people come into the space who don't necessarily know Blam and the work that we do. So Blam UK stands for Black Learning, Achievement and Mental Health. We are a community-based not-for-profit and we focus on three areas, which is education, advocacy and mental health. So in terms of our education limb of things, we go into schools and we run a pro projects and workshops focusing on uh, black history and culture globally. And we look at ways in which we can incorporate black narratives into um, the curriculum and ensure that black narratives are included, celebrated, and the curriculum is decolonized and safe for black children. We also do a lot of teacher training work as well, ensuring that teachers, both secondary school and primary school teachers, have the resources and, and knowledge to equip, equipping them to teach black history from a decolonized lens. Um, under our advocacy limb, we understand that schools are a space that even though that children go to them, they do maintain and reinforce harmful policies that affect black children disproportionately. So we do a lot of work around um, providing free exclusion advocates that can support black children at risk of exclusion. And lastly, under our education, not education, sorry, our mental health limb, we look at how racism affects well-being. So we've recently started a project called Zuri Therapy, which is led by three black psychotherapists, in which we offer free racial wellness workshops to any black person in the UK over a four week period every month, looking at um, racism um, in the UK, looking at the effects of black trauma on the body and looking at ways in which we can develop cope mechanisms to deal with and to cope with living under white supremacy. All these things are on our website, www.blamuk.com um, and also www.blamuk.org. I will be putting a banner up shortly that has all of that information. I will also be putting our Twitter handles and social media, which is at Blam Charity and also our other handle, which is, um, but yeah, both Blam Charity on Instagram and on, on Twitter. So do follow us. Do use the hashtag um, Blam Shubs on Instagram so we can follow, on Instagram and on Twitter so we can follow any commentary and um, do ask any questions in the chat as well. So I'm going to um, let Tolu introduce herself quickly and then we're going to move on to the first part of the event. So the event is in two sections. The first section is we've got a lovely slideshow that we've created for you all that will look at the history of black partying in the UK so that you can have um, informed decisions and questions to ask our wonderful panellist, Heather, who I will introduce later. Um, and just so that we can come together and learn about our culture and our history, because for me, it's so important to see black history and black culture as an important space of inquiry and study. Um, and by looking at the Shubden screen, we're actually giving homage to our ancestors, homage to those that have gone before us, and celebrating um, black expressive creation and also black direct participation in, in the art sector. So I'm going to um, bring Tolu up now to introduce herself as she's going to share her screen soon. Hello everyone, I'm Tolu. I'm the programmes lead at BLAM. I joined BLAM this year and I work mainly on the schools based projects. Today I'm going to be taking you through a little bit about the history of Shubzin and black house parties and we're going to really create a space of black joy and black cultural retention in the UK. So I'm going to share my screen and we're going to just start the presentation now. So if that is up, that should be up now. So Shubs in the UK, 50 years on, that is the name oh, of our... Not, it's not come up yet, Tolu. The oh, okay. Shared, so if you could do that again, that would be helpful. If you could press screen share at the bottom. Okay. I think it's just loading. Okay, great. 
Um, any questions or comments that you have, please write in the chat. It comes directly to us and we can respond to them as well. And I'm just going to put the hashtag in the chat as well. Um, is it up here? No. Have you pressed shared screen at the bottom? Yeah. Yeah, it should. It's nothing's come up. You put, then put, press it. it came up earlier, so I don't know if you try again. Okay. We have technical difficulties. Yeah. Technical difficulties. So while we're waiting, I'm just going to get our um, website up and our, and our Twitter handle so that we can see that and um so right at the bottom so you can follow us up. no do you want to maybe email me the slides or something or? yeah so it's on the drive let me okay um. oh i think i have access to it already Okay, I'm going to try and do a screen share myself. not letting me share my screen i don't know uh, maybe you should leave the um leave the studio and come back because sometimes that helps because it did allow you before Okay, and you want to try and do the share screen again. Oh yeah, now it's working. Hey, okay, there we go. Fresh those technical difficulties. I will start the slides now. So a little bit of a history of what shibs are and house parties and how it came to be known as shibs in. So the word originated in Scotland, sometimes um, people think from Ireland, and is spread across Canada and Zimbabwe and to other English speakers across the Caribbean. And it was originally known as a place where alcohol and um, beverages were sold illegally, but it became popularized in, in the 50s where black people would hold these events in their spaces um, that they felt safe in. And it really became a hub of creativity and black joy. And it became known as Shubzin. So the term kind of evolved to be known as Shubzin and it became a space where black people would come and party and have fun and meet up and just get to know each other. So the Windrush generation came in um, we know a little bit about them. I'll play this video in the background so you can see that. Um, so in the 1950s, the Windrush generation were introduced to the UK. They were actually invited um, by the UK government to try and fill the, the wage gap and also the gap in um, employment that the UK needed at that time. They were classed as British citizens and were freely allowed to function as part of the UK society. However, when they came, they faced a lot of pushback from the British population who attacked them in different ways. Um, in Liverpool, there were um, racist attacks there. In Notting Hill, there were racist attacks. And what they found was that when they came here, they weren't freely allowed in the pubs and the bars and the places where they could really meet as a community and that really started this um, culture of shubzin and house parties um, in the UK. And it became ingrained in the Black British experience and the Black British community. 
So all of those incidents that they face and those racist attacks forced them to find a space where they could feel safe and a space where they could meet up as a community. So the Black British home really became a space of liberation. After these racist attacks, they needed somewhere where they could go and be freely allowed in. And for most of them, that was their home. And the home became a space where people were allowed to come and meet up, dance, have music, display fashion, and just become ingrained in the community that they wanted to be part of. So in 2005, um, the Jeffrey Museum did a really interesting exhibit called the West Indian Front Room, which showed a lot of Caribbean um, front rooms in the UK and how they've evolved and how they are really a space of liberation and cultural retention. I'm just gonna play this quick video that shows you some of the exhibits. from that exhibit, the Black British home was really a cultural archive of its own. And it, the Windrush generation coming in with their cultural values and wanting a space for acceptance and liberation and just have fun, really started that history of Shubzin in the Black community. Oh my, my. And we're gonna watch a quick video that was created by um, ITV where they go into the history of blues parties and Shibzin in Southampton and how that came to be. I'm gonna learn a bit about why this space was needed. The Ebony Rockers performing 40 years ago, their music influenced by nights at blues parties or Shibins, illegal house parties where black culture could be freely enjoyed and celebrated in times of shocking racism. When our parents came here, they weren't even welcome to go and worship in churches or drink in bars. It was a necessity. We needed to have these community spaces in order to congregate, relate our stories to each other and our experiences. And it was also somewhere to feel safe. The untold story of Southampton's blues parties now revealed in a new exhibition. We lived in a society where racism was, was quite rampant and literally black people were not allowed to enjoy themselves. They were open all night, you could buy any drink that you wanted, you could eat your own food and uh, it was a way of being able to bring your culture into the front room and invite your friends and others to have a party. Derby Road was infamous as a red light district 
Less well known are the shabims held in these terrace streets. People actually lived here as well, so it was a little bit noisy. There were complaints, and that's why some of them got raided from time to time. Our speakers were quite big, our amps were quite heavy. And so, yeah, you could hear us from one end of the street to the other. The neighbours probably don't miss the wild nights, but the music, the food, the all-night drinking and dancing are now part of today's culture. It was those kind of places that put the swag in Southampton. And to be honest, if you weren't there, you missed out. <laughs> Rebel Music, the story of blues parties in Southampton, is on at the Showcase Gallery until December the 20th. Admission is free. Kerry Swain, ITV News. So, as you can see from that video, these parties was classed as illegal because they were often selling drinks and um, often had really loud music late at night. But this was out of necessity. Spaces didn't allow black events and spaces didn't even allow black people in them. So the front room was the default place for people to meet and create a space of community. <laughs> And in that, a huge aspect of it was music. A lot of the music was inspired by the Caribbean, brought to the UK by the Windrush generation. Um, a lot of it was reggae and um, inspired by reggae artists at the time. So Lovers Rock is a style of reggae music that is very romantic in style. Um, it was popular in the Caribbean, but it became very, very popular in the UK with the rise of Shabinas and Shubzin in the 60s and the mid 70s. Often the music would come straight from the Caribbean here with um, dub plates and pre-release music and the DJs would mix it and create new sounds and new music for the Shabinas in the UK. Women also played a huge role in, in this community. Although most of these um, parties were hosted by men, a lot of them were hosted by women and they were the singers, the ravers, a lot of them DJs and they had their own sound systems and they had a way with the audience. They had a way to address the audience and get the community um, united. Women have such a, have a huge part to play in community organizing and community building. So they were really crucial to develop to the development of these Shabinas at the time. So as well as music, a huge aspect of it was fashion and dressing and making sure you look nice for everyone who came. And also a part of it was making sure your house looked beautiful. So the wallpaper that we saw in um, the the West Indian front room exhibit is an example of how they would make their front rooms a place where people could really look at art and look at the, the, the things in their front room as an exhibit and a cultural aspect of the performances and the singing and also the fashion. So dance has always played a huge aspect in every African or Caribbean culture. And it is part of cult cultural retention from um, African countries. So Africans use dance as a form of storytelling and it's it's also a form of oral tradition in a way. It's, it plays a part in um, the oral traditions and storytelling such as drum language. So dance is often attributed to drum language. And over time it's developed into a form of self-expression and a love for it in general. So a lot of Shubzin was about dancing and getting together with friends and just being ingrained in that community, learning the new dances. A lot of it was inspired by um, disco in New York, a lot of it inspired by dances from the Caribbean. So it really became ingrained in part of it. Music, fashion, dance, they were all important aspects of um, Shubzin at the time. So a big part of how the Shubzin community has affected all of us as a community is Notting Hill Carnival and street parties as a whole. These are events that started in small spaces and now have become these huge community events that we see today. So for those who don't know, Notting Hill Carnival is an annual event that takes place in August bank holiday weekend every year. 
It started in 1959 in St. Pancreas um, Town Hall in response to really tense race relations at the time. Um, the carnival includes dances, parades, floats. So a lot of the things you've seen the Shibs is the music was really inspired by the Shibs at the time. And it's also influenced by the West Indian and African masquerades in the costumes and the dances as well. This is an aspect of cultural retention and over 2 million people take part in this two day event every year. And to this day, it's still the largest street party in Europe. It is a space of black joy, liberation and cultural retention. And we're gonna play you a little clip of what it's like to be in Notting Hill Carnival for anyone who hasn't been, but it's a great time if we have it on. Yeah, as you can see, it's truly a space of black joy and creativity. And it started through um, the, the, the shubs and it developed into a street party. So we're gonna watch this quick video on how Notting Hill Carnival came to be from Claudia Jones. Um, and I'm gonna go over the slides after. Europe's largest street carnival is a melting pot that embraces diverse cultures, but predominantly reflects Caribbean traditions. Held in Notting Hill with up to 2 million attendees every year on the Sunday and Monday of August bank holiday, Notting Hill Carnival is notorious for its good food, flamboyant costumes, live music, dance and after parties. So, how did this all start? <laughs> 1950s Notting Hill was an area filled with poverty, social neglect and impoverished conditions. It was considered the most concentrated West Indian community in Britain. Post-war Britain racial tension between the Windrush settlers in London caused the Notting Hill race riots of 1958, which were a catalyst for activists to fight for change. Something new and ugly raises its head in Britain. In Notting Hill Gate, only a mile or two from London's West End, racial violence. An angry crowd of youths chases a Negro into a greengrocer shop. While police reinforcements are called up to check the riot, one of many that have broken out here in a few days. The injured victim, a Jamaican, is taken to safety. But the police have not been able to reach all the trouble spots so promptly, and the quietest street may flare up at any moment. Claudia Jones, a Trinidadian, founder and editor of the West Indian Gazette, who fought for black rights and human rights in general, wanted to inspire and unify the community to ease racial tension. The fact that the population at large, because of the whole propaganda against the West Indians, uh, regard them as second-class citizens, and they themselves, on the job, in virtually every sphere of life, find this difficulty uh, since the Immigration Act in terms of discrimination. Alongside Edric Connor, she organized and directed the first Caribbean carnival-like indoor event, Cabaret Style, in 1959, hosting a Caribbean Queen Beauty contest 
and bringing a Trinidadian carnival atmosphere to London, held at St Pancreas Town Hall in Euston, where it was televised by the BBC. From 1960, Stanley Jack was in charge of the show. The second carnival festival was held at the Seymour Hall in Marble Arch, where an array of artists were featured. In 1961, the carnival was held at the Lyceum Theatre, where a Jamaican nurse was the Queen Contest. The 1962 carnival was a momentous one, held at the Seymour Hall once again. Mighty Sparrow, the most celebrated Calypsonian in Trinidad, graced the event. His appearance was highly anticipated and it was his first show ever in England. In the year 1963, the show concept shifted from a beauty contest to a carnival masquerade costume competition. In 1964, Claudia Jones passed away and Rayon Laslett took over, a former social worker that ran a voluntary neighbourhood service from her home. In 1966, the Notting Hill Carnival was officially launched. Mrs Laslett organised a jump-up street party for the neighbourhood children, which turned into a carnival procession when Russell Henderson's steel band walked the streets. The 1967 fair strengthened community cohesion through an array of multicultural art forms, such as music, poetry, and masquerading. This united up to 2,000 hippies, other Britons and West Indians. In 1970, the fair became a people's free carnival. In 1971, Merle Major and the community protested about the carnival being an expression of resistance. In 1972, Ebony still band joined forces with Mel Major and Sulem Baptiste with support of Westway Trust. In 1973, Trinidad and Tobago Carnival transformed the fair to what it is now. In August 1996, Notting Hill Carnival became the first organised outside event by Mrs Laslett Jump Up Street Party for Neighbourhood Children. 2015 will be its 51st annual appearance. So as you can see from that video, Notting Hill Carnival started as an indoor event that emulated the the culture of the shubs, the parties, the drinks, the, the community organizing. And over the years, it developed into the biggest street party in Europe. It was created by Claudia Jones, and she's known as the mother of Notting Hill Carnival. She came to the UK and she had a history of community organizing in the Americas as well. And she really wanted to create a space for the black community, especially following the, the um, Notting Hill racist attack. So this was an attack where a mob of roughly 400 white racists attacked the black community in Notting Hill. The resistance from black community lasted about a week where someone was actually murdered by the white racist at the time, um, Kelso. And Claudia wanted to really build a voice for the community and create a space where people could be free and express their culture. So she started that indoor house party, indoor event that is now known as Notting Hill Carnival. So this really started as a space for black people to be free and have fun and be themselves. And this started because the event spaces weren't allowing people in, pubs weren't playing the music that that um, the Windrush community wanted to listen to. They weren't letting them in the spaces. They weren't hosting events for them. And um, black people had to create their own space and we're really good at creating and we created this community for our ourselves. And till this day, there's still a lot of racism in the event sector, but we still continue to make a way and still continue to make spaces. A lot of venues do not like to host black events because of this popularized narratives of violence um, and damage, um, even though that is very untrue. And also a lot of police tend to look at black gatherings um, unfavorably. So they tend to disperse those events. So we 
we come up with more and more ingenious ways to protect our culture and to keep our spaces safe for us to enjoy and to freely be ourselves. And that is really the root of Shubzin and Shubinas, a space where we can freely have fun and meet up with our community and create new music, listen and dance and meet the people around us. So what does Shubzin look like for us today? We still have the same values. We still have a huge culture of house parties and community organizing in the black community. Um, and it's just getting bigger and bigger. We still have many Shubs events going on, but now there is a lot more demand for it. Um, we have to wait for tickets now to get some of these events, but there are people who still host it like they did in the 60s and 70s in their front rooms and that is still a great part of it. We have different organizations like the Shubs Ticket Link which is um, obviously inspired by the history of Shubzin where we as a black community can go and look at black events and sign up for it and buy tickets there. And there is still a huge demand for black events created by that um, need for it in the 60s and 70s. So 50 years on, we're still Shubs in as a community and we will continue to Shubs as a community as well. So what does Blam recommend in terms of just learning a bit more about the cultural identity, especially the, what the Windrush um, did to build that Black British identity? Right now in theatres, um, there is a show, I am going to pronounce this so wrong, um, there is a show happening right now at the Harold Pinter Theatre, which is based on a day in Carnival, and it really honours Claudia Jones as the mother of Carnival, and it really goes into that Black British community and exploring why we needed this space of um, of cultural resistance and um, also cultural retention. Uh, it's it's a great play. I went to watch it this week. If anyone wants to see it, it's in theatres till the 3rd of July. And also a place to be. So this is kind of like a virtual reality um, kind of event, I would say, by the Arts Oral Council. So it's um, it was written by Michelle Scarlett, who wrote the full script to give an understanding of what Shabins are and how they're established and the important role they played in the community. And I will post a link to that once I finish this um, presentation. I'll post a link to both of them where you can access that. And if you want to hear more about those, just let us know in the comments and we can send you some more information. So that is really the end of this presentation on a bit of Shubzin. I hope you've learned that Shubzin and house parties are an important part of the Black British experience. Um, they are a space of music, dance, cultural attention, fashion and creativity. And they were created out of necessity for Black people to just have a safe space to celebrate themselves. Um, but thank you for listening to this presentation. I think we have the panel coming up. Um, Heather and Ife is going to do the introductions for that. Wow, 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 wow. That was amazing, Tolu. Thank you so much. I learned so much myself. I and mean, it's so nice to be able to see um, the, our history unfolding and see how, um, even though history doesn't often um, repeat itself, often reminds and we're seeing history continue itself with reshaping and revamping itself, but still continuing that cultural legacy. So thank you for that slideshow. It was really, really helpful. So I'm going to um, bring our panellist up today, which I'm really, really honoured to have her here. Um, her name is Heather Nelson. She's the creator and founder of the Black Music Festival, an annual festival in Leeds with programmes developing and supporting up and coming artists. She was recently appointed as the industry professional for the newly developed national programme by PSR Foundation called Power Up, addressing the issues that black artists come across within the industry. Heather Nelson is also the Chief Executive of the Black Health Initiative and the founder of the Legacy Awards. So thank you so much for coming today, Heather. Thank you for having me. Good evening, everybody. Great. So I have a few questions um, in here, uh, Heather, but you feel free to weave um, any of your work in there. So I'm sure the audience would like to know more about that as well. And um, so the first question is kind of going on from what we've just seen. Um, what do you think the development of our party scene today is about black creativity? 
Sorry, you cut out there. What do I? Uh, what do you think the development of our party and scene says about black creativity? I think <laughs> what it does is really evidence that we we can't be stopped. You know, when we're passionate about something, we will find a way and we always do. And even when that comes into question, we will challenge that. So we've been challenging it since the Windrush era. And, you know, I'm fortunate enough to remember firsthand because I'm a first generation um, from the Windrush is the fact that parents were having their parties in there. As children, you, you were upstairs, you know, you could not come downstairs, but you heard the music and you enjoyed it. And then in my times, we continued having parties in friends, front, front rooms, very much like the one that you had shown. Um, the whole um, presentation was fantastic because it was very true to my experience and other people's lived experience. And, you know, it was said very nicely that we were, there was a, a backlash in regards to not wanting us in um, the mainstream places. We need to call it as it was. It was really just racism outwardly. Um, and they didn't want us there. They weren't going to entertain us there. Um, you know, they, they, they didn't play our music. And so we had to kind of invent somewhere. And like you said, we're very creative. And then, you know, when it started to become bigger and more popularized, people then moved the shubbings, as we called them back then, to blues parties. And that's what I remember directly. And a lot of those blues parties, you did have to pay in. You did have to pay for drinks and um, food. They had Caribbean food there. And we did that because there was nowhere else that would have us. And they got raided because they were illegal. You know, you, you can't sell alcohol without a license. That's one way that they would raid. But to be honest, there were death traps because, you know, you're usually down in a basement with only one way to come back up again, etc. But as, as you clearly said, we had to be creative in what we did. The timeline of the music, excellent. I could go on forever, but I'll go for the next question. <laughs> I think just to follow up on that, how do you think, um, you know, you growing up as a Windows child and experiencing the Shabin yourself influenced your own practice as an organiser and, and actually dro drove your work as well? Well, for me, as, as I saw that we still weren't necessarily being welcomed as a teenager and in my early 20s, you know, the people in clubs in the city centre didn't encourage us to go there so they definitely didn't play our music and if you went there I don't know if you heard about the brown paper bag kind of test you know if you were darker than the brown paper bag they didn't want you in their vicinity um, and so a lot of us just couldn't go in so what we did was we utilized certain centers so community centers were a place that we started to use because the house parties got really big so what we had to do was start using community centers and i remember the guys um you know we call them sound systems but really there were small businesses of um it was usually men and they had the teams you know the mc the electrician somebody who would um string up the the the, the boxes you had those who moved the boxes it was a team of men who came together as a sound system and they would play in these community centers for those of us who just wanted somewhere to enjoy ourselves rave with our counterparts and be safe and they kind of ended up being like sound clashes and you know if you if you supported or went out with a particular man who went who was part of another sound system you were part of that sound system crew so it was all very it was competition but friendly it brought the community together we had similarities powerful powerful really really interesting narrative and i like the way that you're giving them agency like people say sounds as some actually it's the business that we've created as a way to maintain culture and heritage and also to bring us together as a community and i really like the fact that you're giving homage because i think all too often we don't hear our um the things that we've created spoken about in that language so it's really nice to kind of hear you speak about that and tell us about how that informed how you did things as well um so thinking about the ideas as you mentioned a lot of these places were raided and um, how would you say a uh, black resistance has maintained the black party space sorry again i don't know if it's me you you have 
Okay, so I think that there's a bit of echo, so I'm going to mute you when I speak, so there's no echo. So how has the black how has black resistance maintained the black party space? Oh, it's maintained it for our resilience. We have we there's no way that we're being stopped. In fact, now as we come to the present day, we're finding that our very resilience has influenced music throughout so not just music that people will say oh that's you know for the black people but it's cross-cutting our beats our lyrics it uh, you know you'd be hard pressed to find anything including punk <laughs> that doesn't have some kind of black beat lyrics feel heart our music is spiritual and you know when you have deep spiritual feeling people might say oh that's going a bit far no it's not because you know we use music in every aspect of our life so it might be funerals it, naming ceremony of your child it could birthday parties anniversaries we use music all the way through and if you're using music all the way through it's because it's feeding something within you and for me and the reason and the driver that i have is that that cannot be lost we have to continue that and share that with every generation that's there hence us having black music festival so that we can share all the music genres that have that black influence and also teaching the young as well about the different beats. You know, many of our musicians in the early days didn't study music. We didn't write it down. It was a feeling, it was spiritual. And I remember going to school with um, a young man who used to just play on his desk some beats and before you know it, we're all rocking to it and like jumping up and dancing, you know, before the teacher came, of course. But, you know, and, and that was natural. It cannot be taught. So, you know, when people say, well, you know, music's universal, it is now. But it will always have that spirituality, which came from our African ancestors. There's no way, no matter whether you're from, you know, Trinidad, Jamaica, Barbados, whatever Caribbean island, our roots, our spirituality comes from the African continent. And that's what keeps us going as resilient people, but also through our music as well. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, when you was mentioning about how our music has become the mainstream genre in the UK, I was thinking about um, a documentary I, I was watching by GRM Daily, which platform a lot of black artists and black musicians. And um, D Block Europe was speaking at a documentary and they were saying that um, they did like, um, a festival and they're like the whole of middle england with their wellington boots were there jumping up to songs that we created and you know they're just thinking we're just some the two black guys from the local community and you know seeing how black music has such a wide reaching influence and they were saying that i think it was a newspaper that I, article i read recently saying that one of the biggest exports from the uk is uh, black british music and it was talking about grime music being a, something that is revealed all over the world so in terms of we're seeing that collective creativity just maintaining um, everybody in the UK, you know? And I really loved what you said about the link to, to Africa because that is definitely what keeps us going as a people. And um, for black people, music and dance is ancestral for us, you know, back on the African continent, um, when, whether you're having a naming ceremony, whether you're having um, um, someone's wedding, whatever you're doing, dance is something that's integral. And we can see um, even, those of African descent taken to the Caribbean and how dance is still maintained as something that's really an ancestral and important in the community. So whatever we do as black people, you see dance being centered there because on the African continent, we always had dance, music, drumming, beats. Those are all things that we were always doing. So we're seeing ways in which the cultural attention is, is carrying on and helping us as a people build resistance. So thank you for sharing that. And the next question I have for you is kind of tying into what you were saying about um, we having to start using community spaces like um, community centres because the home got too big. But I also looked at the home as a community centre in and of itself. So um, obviously um, we spoke about um, these two shabins in the house, but also even things like church was done in the house as well. Um, and I don't know if you know about the work of Jessica and Eric Hartley, but they had a bookshop in their front room as well, selling books for the community, a black bookshop. So in terms of um, the home in and of itself, it was a community space, basically a community centre before it got too big where we had to obviously now get a community centre because people couldn't fit in anymore. So I wanted to, you to talk about how we have revolutionised the home space 
um, as black people through cr black creative arts and black uh, direct participation in arts as well. Okay, so if we look back like you have just done, because we weren't welcomed in mainstream venues, we did have to use our homes. Um, the front room, the kitchen, if you had a basement, it was done up. Um, you know, you'd have sometimes after school clubs um, in, in the basements because our schools were not teaching us in the curriculum our true history. So a lot of parents who were educated would send, would teach the young children there and um and in in, in instill self-esteem self-belief self-confidence self-worth and i think when you look at where we lived as a community center as you say again that's where our resilience and we had to i think as we've kind of grown and somewhat um integrated into western society we're losing that there's less of it but, there are, but the positive of that is we have organisations that are now developing and have their charitable status to be able to continue the traditions and teach the traditions that we know. It, the home now has become a lot more, I think, individual and less community based. And again, I think that's because we as a people have um, integrated more we're studying outside of our, you know, um, family home. So we're moving out to universities from out the cities that we were brought up in. Um, we are becoming a lot more fragmented. I think there's now, a, I would say, a revolution of understanding the need to come back together collectively because there's strength in our numbers. And if you continue being individual rather than acknowledging the community aspect, you end up with a weathering effect, which is a racism that keeps on pulling you down. We need to be amongst each other. And I think that's why you will see um, more street parties. So you'll find that people are holding um, street parties in the backyard. I know the last um, few days, couple of weeks, we've had really hot weather. And, you know, people are out there and you can see them barbecuing in the backyard and the chairs are coming out in the garden and in the alleyways or on the street, etc. And so it shows that we still have that spirituality of wanting to be together. And we use food as a mechanism, food and music. Once you've got those two, you've got an excellent event. So for me, we we... We've kind of separated, but we're coming back together again, actually recognising that we have um, a lot more in common than the differences that we once were told. Because, you know, as many people will say with Caribbean islands and they'll say, you know, rep your flag. In essence, those weren't our original flags. You know, our original flags come from the African continent. We just don't know which part of Africa those of us from the Caribbean were dropped off at. So when we come to England and we say we're repping our flags, yes, we're repping the Caribbean islands that we were dropped off at. But in essence, that spirituality is still bringing us together. That heartbeat is what I call it of the community is showing that resilience. So we might still call it in the house, but you know, we're doing it in the streets. We're doing it in the parks. We're utilizing the, the, the open spaces more, you know, because of ours. And we can do. Um, obviously, it's now COVID, so there's different restrictions. But, you know, people were going to the parks and, and having their cookouts and playing the music. And it, it felt good. The kids enjoyed it. They were safe. The adults were there and proud of their young ones. Again, that community spirit. So the resilience is there. The evolution of what we had were building on because it was a strong, solid foundation was our music and still is and always will be to the point like you've just pointed out that, you know, the UK is actually exporting more of music and the music is ours. I don't care what anyone says, it's, our, it's ours. It stemmed from us. It came from us. And, you know, it doesn't matter who's actually going to be performing it, which is good because the music is to be shared. In essence, it's ours. Oh, that was so beautifully said. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, I agree with everything you said. And I think it's so important to be able to have space to recognise those links mm -hmm. and to build them and to give credit where credit is due as well. So I think it's a combination. Um, so my next question is, 
do you think the event sector has made room for black artists and black led events or as they say in Pacto, do we just take it by force um so yeah what what do you what do you see what do you say i think the music industry has has a, and it's not a glass ceiling it's a, a well, i was going to swear then it is a concrete ceiling yeah so they will allow artists to get to a certain level and they will for want of a better term whitewash them so that they can be more attractive to the masses so in essence you have to make a choice of whether you're going to stay true to your roots and your essence or whether you're going to be somewhat adaptable so that you can be attractive to a mass audience and if you get signed usually i'm not saying all the time but usually that's the case. You have to be mindful of what you're putting out and what will be acceptable. We've seen artists who have been pulled for various reasons. I think what we need to have are more people that look like you and I sat in the boardrooms, you know, when so that when they are saying what they may want to say, what when they're actually talking about... Um, um, things that they don't really know because culturally it's not theirs, we can say something and support those artists. So I can see people throwing money at the lower level of music when really what we want is to develop those who are already in the music scene so that they can sit in the boardroom and represent us. Did I answer your question? Because sometimes I just go off. Sorry. <laughs> part one, and I, def I definitely agree with you. I don't think there should be nothing about us without us. No decisions being made about us without us being in the room. I think it's so, so important. So the second part of the question was um, looking at black led events as well. Has this event sector made room for us or did we just take it by force? Well, OK, I remember that bit of the question, which is we had to take it. <laughs> We, you know, we um, we are invited in small chunks, in palatable chunks, but that's not enough. And what we have to do is take that. We have been here for, what, three generations now. This is our right. We've worked, we've paid taxes. Um, you know, those venues are our venues. And I think if we work collectively, it's less likely that we get turned down. Um, and that's what we need to do separately. We can go so far, collectively we can go further. And, you know, we need to connect, we need to network. Um, we all have our different issues, our different issues that we're going through, but we all have our strengths. And with those strengths, if they're combined, we can move mountains. And, and you know, we need to also look about how, how have we got any venues any spaces that we can use you know should we buy our own as well you know should we be developing our own venues you know i once was um i gave a lecture the other day talking about being invited to sit around the table and then i thought well should we just build our own table i'm not bringing a chair and i'm not going to sit there and be ignored so maybe we should build our table know what our know what our agenda is and invite them to our table <laughs> invite them so that we can tell them what we want, how we're going forward, what is missing. And to be honest, we have a number of allies out there that want to work with us. We just need to find out who they are so that not only can they be our voice around the table where we're not welcome, but they can open the doors for us to walk in as well. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think you know, following in that tradition of Pan-Africanism and, and Garveyism, the idea of doing for self is so important. I think, you know, as a people that have been oppressed and colonised, I think doing for self is one way of resistance and creating our own spaces of resistance. Um, and also to be autonomous and to be able to have um, control over what we put out. And I think, yeah, we definitely need more community spaces that belong to us, um, that understand us and cater to us. Um, and not scared to be unapologetically black. They don't feel like they have to pander to whiteness or make them so palatable, but to just be authentically black, I think that's something that we need to develop. And I, we're seeing, I've seen you know, a lot more black spaces have been created that is kicking much in depth, which is a black owned um, sort of, um, I'd say it's like a cafe, but it's it's it, the cafe doesn't do it justice. So I think more of a bar, bar lounge, yeah, bar lounge. So I think more of the kind of spaces, you know, like I always think back to like 
how important the Bangrove restaurant was for the black community in the 70s and 80s because it had the food, it had the culture, it had the history. And it also had the culture retention, you know, the pro-blackness and, and all of that there. So I think it's so important that we have more black places that we can go to and use for our own events so we don't have to keep fighting against the system that doesn't want us and just do for self. So yeah, yeah, I think that's really, really important. Um, um, my last question to you, if I put it out to the audience, is um, what are upcoming projects and events excite you and um, when looking at the Black creativity and Black art scene? Wow. Oh, oh, gosh. Um, well, <laughs> there's so many events. Anything that is Black-led for me is exciting. Um, you know, different genres, different events from you showed carnival through to, um, you know, reggae, um, and I'm, I'm including UK reggae in that, to soul, to grime, to hip, anything that is black led excites me because again, it's it shows that we're being featured. So I've, I, I, you know, I, I applaud anything that that's going on and try to go to as many as possible to be honest and network and see how and share so that we we don't have to keep on making the same mistakes amongst us we can learn from each other's and and know what works and what doesn't work and avoid the pitfalls so everything i know that's a real blanket answer but i really couldn't just name one it has to be all oh, sorry <laughs> Yes, no, no. I think that that's very powerful. I think there's there's beauty in, in seeing how the whole scene is developing, and it's not just one, and they all intertwine and support each other and actually help the whole um community grow. So I think that's a really good answer. And what I'm dying to know is when will the Black Music Festival come back? You know, what, what what's happening? How's COVID affected you? And when can we see a return? Because I haven't actually been to any sort of events in Leeds, but I've heard the Leeds Carnival is amazing and uh, Black Music Festival as well. So it'd be nice to know when we can come back to come together and celebrate Black culture and Black excellence. Yeah, well, last year we had to put Black Music Festival online. Um, so that actually reached a bigger crowd than we would have actually had in the park, which was fantastic. This year we have separated the genres and we will, we will be having them in different venues. So a couple of them will be in the O2 Academy. It goes back to talking about being resilient. <laughs> you know, if we can't have the one big festival, that's fine. We will have different events in different venues and those who are attracted to the different events will, will choose which one they want to go to and enjoy or collectively just buy a ticket for all of them, which is fantastic. And really, really looking forward to, to coming back together in the park. And because as much as you may have the different events in venues, we, you know, we still have to do that distancing and we don't have that connectivity that we would have and also talking about spirituality when you're together it's different you know the we call it the vibe the vibe's different isn't it when you're with your friends and the music lick and you're just enjoying yourself um so yeah i i'm hoping and i'm praying i don't do the cross finger thing i do the prayer i am praying that we're going to be back in the park 2022 but until then this year it will be in different venues we will be live streaming for some um and recording and then putting it all together and putting it on the website so that's when you'll see black music festival in its essence which will be next year yeah, I'm joining my prayer with um, your prayers with my prayers, and I, I am looking forward to that. But definitely, you have to send us the links and when everything is live, and we could tweet about it. I'll definitely get my ticket because I am so excited to be able to be in community and just be with our music, with our culture, and to come together and celebrate. So, something I'm definitely looking forward to. So, we're drawing to the close of today's event. Um, I must say, this has been amazing. Thank you so, so much, Heather. I've learned so much from you. It was so nice to be able to sit with our elders and be able to take wisdom from you and have that oral tradition going that is so um, akin in African, African descended community. So thank you for coming to the space and connecting with us today. Also want to give a massive shout out to Tolu and Precious who have been behind the scenes supporting, um, getting this event ready and making this event perfect in the slides and, and doing all of their hard work. So I just want to say thank you for coming um, Yes. Oh, we do have a question, actually, which I missed. So maybe I'll just ask a question before we round off, Heather. Um, 
And two questions, actually. What is the best part of the original Shabinas? Um, and the other question is, is it going to be more expensive to organise um, events that you're doing now in the separate sort of John, um, the new separate sort of um, way that you're doing it? Right. Uh, right. So the first question is about the Shabinas. What was it? Sorry, I didn't write it down quick enough. What was the best what was the best part of the original should be? I'll just put it up. For me, um, as a kid, actually watching it was seeing all our elders, our parents coming together and enjoying because they came here and they were very much focused on, you know, doing the best they could for their families. Some even had the intentions of saving money and returning back to their Caribbean islands. But, you know, survival was harder here, so they didn't manage to do it. But at least you could see the tension of working released when they all got together and, you know, they, they, they just enjoying themselves, the food, the music at the beginning, the men playing the dominoes and slapping it loud and laughing and the women in the kitchen making sure they're doing the curry and the roti and the rice. Just the whole atmosphere for the Shubins was fantastic for me. In regards to Black Music Festival, it's a lot more expensive. Um, but we have managed to secure some grants so we can keep the tickets to an absolute minimum. There's nothing that we're doing that's going to be more than £10 for you to come in. So, you know, I, I give thanks that we managed to get that grant. Leads are supporting us as well. So, yeah, um, it's been difficult. The pandemic's been difficult for everybody. But like we said, we're resilient people. And where there's a will, there's a way. Wonderful. So that's a lovely way to end tonight off. We're going to get some lovely discounted tickets. And you know, Black people, we love a discount. We love a discount. So thank you for all that you've done, Heather, and, and all the work you put in behind the scenes for the community and being in spaces and standing up for our culture and, and just, you know, being there and, and just being someone that can be relatable and just pushing the, the culture forward. So I just want to say thank you for all that you've done and continue to do. Don't know if you have any closing words as well, Tola, before we round up. Thank you, Heather, for joining us today and for like inputting your wisdom and your experiences. And thank you, Fair, for all the great questions and making sure this event ran smoothly and the technical difficulties. Thanks for solving those. And thank you to everyone who listened as well. And I hope you learned something today about the history of Shibzin and the legacy in the Black British space. Thank you. Thank you. All right, bye everyone on um, the live. <laughs>